guys. So if you're at all into tweeting, yeah. we should play tonight. Yes. Right now. I have them on it. Awesome. <laughs> okay, so everybody's in here. Awesome. Well, thank you everybody for coming for osmosis again. Uh, these are our bi-monthly meetings that we do first and third Thursday of every month, um, usually around topics uh, directly related to games or peripherally related. Um, uh, and tonight we're going to kind of, a bit peripherally, uh, as far as the film industry goes, uh, Phil's going to talk about that here in Phoenix, um, a bit more robust than the game industry, I think, uh, at least in a, right. in a structured fashion. Right, right. Um, again, game collab, so we're a co-working space for game developers. Uh, we also help with uh, publicity and, and act as an agent for some different uh, game developers around here in Phoenix, uh, working on projects around gamification and games in general. Um, we have a membership structure, $10, $100 a month kind of thing. You can check that out on our website. Um, otherwise, yeah, th just spread the word and then and, uh, help you guys come more often and, and regularly to the things we do. We also do game nights on Tuesday nights that you can come and play games, learn about game mechanics and stuff like that from kind of first hand just for about six hours on Tuesday. It's like from 10, or 6 till 10 p.m. kind of thing. So, so without uh, further ado, I'd like to introduce Phil uh, Brastock from the Phoenix uh, Film Office. Office. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Talk about kind of multimedia and, and the way what, what's up with the film uh, mm -hmm. scene here and how he sees games being kind of a part of that. Yeah, definitely. Cool. So thank you all for having me. Uh, my name is Phil Bradstock with the City of Phoenix Film Office. And probably best just to start out and tell you a little bit about me. I am absolutely not a gamer. Um, I think that the only game that I have on my phone, which I've fallen in love with, and I don't know if this is popular and other people have heard of it, but um, Islands. With the one with like, well, the loading is like media core, with like the uh, fire with the water, and you have to put out the fires, and it's a big puzzle game oh, cool. that you got to go through. It's actually, I'm completely hooked on it. Um, it's a great thing to play. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess just this one. I tried, I tried, I tried Angry Birds, and I conquered that one. That was it. Gateway drug. Islands. What's that? The gateway drug is Islands. Oh, okay. <laughs> right now, I am. So, uh, so anyway, so I'm basically a Phoenix native. I uh, moved here when I was one years old and went to Brophy as my high school. And then I went to Boston College where I got a degree in political science. I was supposed to go to law school and then uh, kind of didn't want to go study anymore. And so I ended up traveling around the world for a year. I was uh, only going to be gone for two weeks. And then I met these Kiwis who told me about this concept called backpacking. And I thought, well, that sounds kind of fun. So I ended up following Endless Summer around the world um, with a surfboard when I was a little bit thinner and was actually out there swimming in the water. And uh, anyways, came back home and I got a job. Uh, my family's in Hollywood and so my, so my cousin was on a show called Suddenly Susan and it had been canceled. But they still had to make five more episodes so everybody just jumps off and ship immediately when that happens because you want to go find your next job. So I got a job at what's called a writer's PA which is where you get the writers their lunches make sure they have no mayo or extra mayo or whatever it is. It's a great Boston College degree. Um, I'm sure Wake Forest here could appreciate that. And I uh, did that, and I realized it's a lot like the construction industry, which is what my father was in. So I continued on there um, at Warner Brothers, became a production coordinator, and I basically did multi-camera sitcoms. That was my forte. Three walls, four cameras, audience, stand-up comedian, laugh tracks, all of that. I uh, met a woman, became my wife, and uh, we but got sick of Hollywood and decided to leave. And so we moved here to Phoenix and just so happened they were hiring for a film commissioner, the woman that had held the position since 1978, retired in 2005. And uh, so I put my name in the hat and ended up hiring me. So that's how I got here to the city of Phoenix. And just a little bit about the Phoenix Film Office. Basically what my job is, is it's to promote the Phoenix area to filmmakers and attract them here. And what we're really looking after is their job creation and also their tax revenue into the city because these projects, as you can imagine, can sometimes be in the millions of dollars of range, which is a big economic impact on the city. So I act, um, once they once they come here, I'll drive them around to to help them find some locations, but then I act as their logistics coordinator. So if you want to blow through a red light, uh, I can make that happen. If you want to fire off a gun or detonate a bomb in downtown Phoenix, I'm the guy that allows you to do that. We had NASCAR, uh, not NASCAR, we had a Red Bull a couple years ago, and I love the Red Bull guys because they're, former skateboard video people that Red Bull kind of picked them up and then started to kind of move them up. And now they're rolling around in black Cadillac Escalades. I mean, they're hysterical when they come into town. But they were doing something for Red Bull with a NASCAR and um, they had the, the, drip, or the drip champion of the world, some Kiwi guy out of New Zealand. And so it was something with Brian Vickers and the guy had to go from out in the middle of the desert 
with some pizza or some Red Bull or something, come into town, peel through, and then end up at some frat house, and then he delivers all of the cases of Red Bull. So anyways, we're meeting with them, and they said, well, you know, we really want to drive in downtown Phoenix with this car. It's street legal. And we said, okay, well, it's not a problem. What do you want to do? And they wanted to go up Washington on a Wednesday. Luckily, it was Veterans Day, so it was closed. So they said, well, how fast can we go? And we said, well, how fast do you want to go? And they said, well, the speedometer stops at 150. And the police said, we'll just we'll play it by ear. Well, sure enough, that car was not some street legal. It was a NASCAR with two little red lights in the back and a license plate holder. And that was it. The thing was an actual test NASCAR. So he was going well over 150 miles an hour up to the state capitol, Tokyo drifting around it, doing donuts all over. So those are the kind of things that I get to do, which are a lot of fun, um, a lot of the logistics that go on there. So um, you're probably kind of wondering why I'm here, you know, since it is Hollywood, if you will, and television and films, and you all are gamers in the industry. Well, it's actually, there's a lot of crossover between the two industries, and it's really something that the film industry locally is trying to explore more is how to incorporate the gaming industry into the motion picture industry. And mind you, when I say motion picture, you think of the big movies that are on the screens, um, all the big blockbusters. It's, it's kind of like, the term's almost like an album. You hear artists dropping albums all the time. Well, really, there's no album. It's an MP3 file or a digital download. But we still refer to it as motion picture in the film industry just because it's an old term. So anyways, um, there's, there's been a... There's been a you know, big crossover between those two industries now. It used to be when you were dealing with a Nintendo and a 64 bits, that's not going to make it onto a big screen because you're going to see all the flaws. Well, now it's gotten to the point where the people in the gaming industry are the same people working on the movies that are also the same people now working in the medical industry during doing imaging of hearts and brains and sort of that. So it's all now finally starting to come together. Where it'll go, I don't know, but there's been a lot of crossover between them. Um, another, you know, I'll get into some interesting things here. Um, you know, it used to be back in the day, I'm joking now, sorry. It used to be back in the day that when we had these film projects that came into town, there were just these gigantic looking operations with 40, 50 people, still use film in the cameras, tons of lights, generators, cables running everywhere. Well, over the years, as you know, cameras don't use film anymore. Everything is digital. So now the production crews have gotten down a lot smaller, and a lot of people, you know, can, not a lot of people, but you can make movies and take photos with your iPhone just as easily as you can with a major camera. So this industry is really transforming and it's coming down to the two com type of computers you see in front of you now. Back when I left Warner Brothers in 2005, Avid was the way that everybody did editing. Huge machines, had to have their own dedicated air conditioner in the room. And when I left Warner Brothers, they were testing laptops to be their main editors uh, as, their, as their editing platform rather than Avid. So that really progressed. They had Final Cut Pro that was really going, although I understand recently Final Cut Pro is no longer doing Pro versions. They are doing it for the common user. And so now everybody's going back to the Avid. And so it's very interesting. All these people thought they had these decrepit systems are now all of a sudden the only game in town because there's no more support for Final Cut. So it's more for what you can buy right off the shelf with your Mac or something, just more of a user to, you know, me to do my kids' movies. That's kind of more what Final Cut Pro is now. So you look shocked. No, it's just that's blows me away, man. It's like, yeah. that's, that's a weird move to make because like Unity's like we're democratizing games. So for me, Final Cut would be like you'd have a team that's like full time production staff, mm -hmm. and then you'd have those that help like the simple user. That way, you have like your big budget people. Yeah. So it's shocking to me that they would go with Pro. Like, well, there's not that many people that can really use Pro because it's so advanced, and so I think that was the problem. They were probably putting so many resources into it, mm -hmm. and not enough people were buying. I mean, the studios would buy it. And maybe your production companies, I mean, locally in town, we've got you know, around 60 legitimate production companies in Greater Phoenix. But it's really not a big market to sell to. But if you can put it on the laptop and sell it as part of the packaging, that's where you can make the money. So, yeah, it's kind of interesting. So that's how the industry is actually really starting to shrink nowadays. Um, you know, it used to be out here, the film history in Phoenix has always been kind of movie of the weeks, been feature films, been TV shows. Uh, but that all really disappeared in uh, starting in the 1990s, believe it or not. And I don't know, how many of you are familiar with film incentives? Okay, you got there a little bit? All right. So film incentives, give you a quick history on that. Uh, they came around in 1990, roughly, thereabouts. That's when Vancouver decided to incentivize the film industry. So they offered this incentive. Hollywood was, was transforming from a very art culture to a very uh, accounting culture. A lot of bean counters were making a lot of decisions. So they started moving the projects up to Canada. What they were finding is that coupled with the incentive and the, and the dollar ratio, the you know, equivalency between the Canadian and U.S. dollar, for every buck they spent, they got back 60 cents, basically. 
So that's why you saw X Files. Um, a lot of big name shows went up to Vancouver, then into Toronto, and all throughout Canada. Well, about 2000, uh, there was a big movement uh, with the unions to make to bring it back into America. Well, at that time, there started to be a leveling of the U.S. of the currency between the two dollars, and also New Mexico and Louisiana said, "Well, let's offer an incentive." So they offered this incentive. Studio said, "You want it made in America, meaning Los Angeles, which is what the unions want," and they said, "Fine." So they send the projects over to New Mexico and Louisiana. All of a sudden, those two states start seeing a lot of projects going on, and a lot of big projects, million-dollar movies coming in. So that's when every single state decided, we're going to jump on this bandwagon as well. We're going to start getting in the incentive game. So that's why Arizona, starting in January of 2006 through December of 2010, had a film incentive program. And it actually created uh, 50, brought in 56 projects, that spent $110 million here in the state of Arizona over the span of five years. So basically that's $20 million going into our economy a year, just straight cash coming from outside of Arizona right into our economy. And it was seen as a bonanza, it was really good. Part of that incentive actually was for gaming. And I don't know if you know that, but it was actually written into the legislation. And I'll just give you a quick definition. Um, this is an old Senate bill. There's been a lot of history with this incentive. Um, I was I kind of helped write little few portions of this of this legislation, uh, but basically out, after it ended, there's been no incentive since then. So we've been trying to revive it ever since. But basically, our definition of a motion picture. Excuse me, this is a little bit long, but it'd be good to hear. Um, motion picture production company or production company means any person primarily engaged in the business of producing entertainment content created in whole or part in this state, including motion pictures, documentaries, long-form productions, specials, series, miniseries, recordings, music videos, uh, television programming, and then here's where it gets to you guys, interactive television, interactive games, video games, commercials, and commercials, or, or, or any format of digital media. So basically, with the way this legislation was written, and it did not pass, basically what it said is that for as long as you spend a minimum of $250,000 here in the state of Arizona, what's qualified Arizona spend, you would be eligible to get back 20% tax refund on that. So, what's interesting is, and you guys, are you familiar with a, with a company called uh, 2XL Games? Yep. All right. So, this is all public records, so I'm gonna read you some facts and figures here, um, but this is in the public domain, so I don't feel bad about doing it. So, it looks like 2XL Games um, got about, eh, yeah, it looks like close to $2 million in tax incentives for their games, uh, golf and motocross matchup, for two of the games. And has anybody ever heard of a thing called Cheyenne Enterprises? Oh, yes. Hey. <laughs> anybody want to guess what their uh, post-approved tax credit amount was? It was $4.3 million. So, what this means is that while you're making the small games and going to the iPhones and for your own personal use, totally great to do. If you ever took it to another level, and if the state had a tax incentive, you could actually get potentially 20% back. And with the way that this, with the legislation was written, if you hired Arizona residents, you'd get back 25% of their wages. So it's very advantageous uh, to the gaming industry. There's a lot of opposition to this bill. Uh, I know you guys think, well, this is great. You know, you're getting something, and you know, for the motion picture, you know, we've got. A great example is a Lone Ranger that didn't come to Arizona because we didn't have a film incentive. Probably, I think it was a hundred and forty million dollar movie or something. But is that twenty five percent of the tax revenue generated by the no, 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 twenty five percent of your waste. spend? Yes, of what you're spending. Really? Yeah. Now you know why people don't like it. <laughs> Go ahead. So they were going to film the Lone Ranger here, and then they decided not to. So there's a lot of movies that we're going to film here that are not being done here because we don't have it in incentive. Can you name them? Oh yeah, not a problem. George Lopez, uh, they contacted me back in February, they just called me two weeks ago. He's got a production company, and you know the, um, it's the Carl Hayden High School, the MI, the, the kids with the robotic, okay, mm -hmm. they're turning that into a movie. George Lopez is the teacher in it. They're making it in New Mexico, because we have no incentives here. But they're going to fly in for a day and do a scene with one of the actors, because they're probably, I, I was pitching the Arizona Center to him because they want something kind of Arizona-y looking with the landscape in the background with the kids going around trying to get funding for a school project. Mm -hmm. So that's one that we lost. Um, you, know the, you, know the, you know the Lost Boys, the yeah, refugees? Yeah. Okay, you see them sometimes working oh, in the yeah, stores. Yeah, they're lost. Because apparently some lady in Scottsdale, she's really been the impetus behind bringing them here. has been doing it for quite a while. 
So she called me and she said, I'm not somebody just blowing smoke up your ass. I'm, I really do know these people. I'm very involved with this organization. I'm the leader of it, basically. And we're making a movie about this, but they're not going to shoot in Phoenix. They're going to take it to Albuquerque. And I said, okay, well, is this kind of a big budget movie? Who's behind it? And she said, well, Ron Howard. And I go, well, Ron Howard goes after incentive states. We're not an incentivized state, so we're not going to see anything. And to give you an example, this is a map of the state of, or not the state, of America. All the colored states represent those that have some type of an incentive. You notice we are on an island. We are a white state, meaning we offer absolutely nothing. So Arizona gets passed over for all of these projects. Anything that's going to be in the incentivized world, um, you know, every state's got a minimum spend and on the back, and I'll pass some of these out too so you can see, they'll have a minimum spend of like 50000 100000 something like that. But any, any project that would qualify for an incentive is typically going to look for the incentive first. And then if they can't find it or it doesn't pencil out, because if they're right at that break point, say they're 10000 over, like ours was $250,000, let us say their budget's 260000 Arizona spend, you also have to hire accountants to audit the books on the back end, and then you really don't get a return, so <coughs> it's not worth it. You got a question? Yeah, um, the, the ones that are marked red on there, mm -hmm. um, what, what, how much incentive is there for them? To get Those are transferable tax credits. Are you guys familiar with tax credits at all and how they work? Mm -hmm. Here, I'll go ahead and just kind of flip those back. It's probably way more than we need, so you can just toss them on the floor. Uh, but basically, a transferable tax credit at the end of the day is the way our program was originally structured, and it meant that any, if you, you obviously have tax liability. Anything left over that gives you basically a certificate, you can't cash that in. But you can turn around and sell it to other companies that have some form of tax liability in the state of Arizona. So generally, for every, I think the rate was for every dollar in tax incentives you had, you could sell it at eight for 80 cents. Because there was a broker that was going to, you get back 80 cents. There was a broker that was going to make three, three cents on the dollar. Um, but it's all, it's all in the deals and the transactions. A tax refund just basically means at the end of the day, if you're eligible for a million dollars in tax in, in, in an incentive, and you have $100,000 in tax liability, then the state will write you a check for 900 grand. That's how it works. Now, the arguments against this, as you can kind of see, as you alluded to, a great example is <laughs> if you're at Costco, let's say, or you're, you're at some place and you buy, a, you buy something for 100 bucks. That's the price tag. You go to the cash register, what's the actual price? It's $108.20 and 20 or 30 cents. Where is that, you know, what does that tax break out to? Well, basically the 20 or 30 cents goes to Maricopa County, two bucks goes to the city of Phoenix, six dollars goes to the state of Arizona. So on that hundred dollar purchase, state makes six bucks. But they're turning around and writing you a check for twenty dollars. So they're, uh, they're backwards 14 bucks right on that transaction. And so that's why, that's the main argument against these type of incentives, and that's why I think you're gonna see a lot of scrutiny as there already has been uh, from these incentives. And to give you an ideal idea, um, for 2010, they put, there was $36 million spent in the state of Arizona. 2010 generated $670,000 in taxes for the state of Arizona directly. They paid out $9.3 million, meaning the state lost $8.6 million. <coughs> now, people will say, Phil, you're arguing against this. You must not be for film. No, it's just reality and it's the math. And it's always good to know what the people are against. So when you're talking about gaming and possibly trying to build an industry, you know, incentives are definitely going to help you, but there's a but you know, there's a lot of opposition to this to these to this type of an incentive. Um, so if you, anybody's interested, there's a group called the Arizona Film and Media Coalition. They're the ones that have been leading the charge for the bill. Basically, we found that um, in general, uh, the governor has been against the bill, and that's why a lot of people won't fight for it too hard um, within the House and the Senate. So it's done a complete uphill challenge. So on a flight out to Oklahoma, I was reached out to by a guy that works in the reservation in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. um, they're actually looking to change the type of games that they have in the casinos for gaming yeah. into games that are modern games. Um, okay. One of the things was, have you reached out to the local reservations or the people around here asking them if they're doing game development or game development still because I know they can't. I don't know if you do that. No, I don't because I primarily deal with the logistics of the filmmaking on City of Phoenix property. Um, not so much that area that you're talking about. That would be more the coalition okay. reaching out and trying to get a groundswell of support. So when they go to the state legislature, that's something they could talk about to them to say, by the way, we have this and this and this that also supports this. I'm just saying, city, not the state. What's that? I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no, it's city. I'm with the city of Phoenix, correct. Is there another person? 
Costco their counterpart? Um, that's an interesting question. The answer is yes and no. Phoenix is the only one that has a proper film office. I've got experience in Hollywood doing this type of work. Mm -hmm. When you go to another city, what you're going to end up with is a special events person. So let's say you're in Tempe and you want to throw the light parade or you want to do some events in the Tempe Beachfront Park. You would go to uh, the lady there to get that permit. She's also the same lady you go to to get a film permit. So they're, they're, you know, they're basically there to do special events. They're not there to do film. Whereas in Phoenix, all I do is film. Well, I do develop economic development too, but my primary focus I got hired for was film. So that's kind of a specialty. Does that mean you also control like the parks? So if they wanted to do a big outdoor scene in like one of the Maricopa cool. County parks, that would be no, a that's county. Oh, yeah, okay. you, it's it's almost in a way if you think about like the U.S. Embassy mm -hmm. in France, that's considered sovereign U U.S. Mm -hmm. territory, even though it's in France. When you get into Phoenix, there's little pockets with, with county and state. I don't have any control over that. You have to go to that agency. So I always tell people, if you're going to film, get on the Phoenix side so I can help you, because I can't help you when you cross the street. Um, are these incentives the reason why Breaking Bad ended up being filmed in totally. Turkey? And, yep. okay. and that's why they redid their incentives recently, and it's called the Breaking Bad incentive. That's the okay. nickname of it. And the reason wasn't to try and prolong that series, because all series die. It was to try and to say, hey, listen, this was made out here. We're known for it. Bring other projects like this. And that's the main key. You know, these movies are really great that we get. But the problem with the movies is that they only last for six or seven months, and then they're gone. How many seasons has Breaking Bad been on? Five seasons. Five, five seasons. So that's a good five years' worth of work and employment going on. Mind you, they shut down for hiatuses for a couple of months. But those people are working continuously versus a major movie where you get on it, and then six months later you get dropped off of it, and then you got to go find a new one again. And tourism has increased since. <laughs> tourism, yeah, it definitely has increased. And that's also an argument people make. They say, well, this is a really great incentive for tourism. And I say, well, it's really hard to gauge that. If you've got a big winner, then yes, it does. And clearly, Breaking Bad is one of those type of movies. I mean, if the Brady Bunch was shot in Oklahoma, that house that's, you know, that's the main house, that would be a tourism thing. We, you know, it's really hard to gauge the actual tourism. Like, if you ever, and if any of you have gone to Disneyland, you know, they have people there saying, oh, can I ask you a quick question? Where are you from? Where are you staying? How long do you plan on being here? They can gather that data. You don't see anybody like that at the airport when people are getting off the airplanes capturing any of that data. So tourism, if it's big, yes, you can capture it if it's a very well-known thing. But if it's just some movie that was shot, probably not. Like we had Everything Must Go with Will Ferrell shot out here. That was in, that was in Arcadia, the Arcadia neighborhood where they shot that. But who's going to come out here to take a look at where they shot that movie? Nobody yeah. is. Well, maybe you live here. You know? <laughs> Calle de Rosa was the street, by the way, where they filmed. What was it? Calle de Rosa. Um, uh, for the incentives, when people are making these decisions, do they take into account uh, union practices when considering the incentives? Because I know in California, there's, and I'm not familiar with it recently, but there was a previously issue with overtime payments for people like game developers. Mm -hmm. So if they're giving incentives like this, are they also taking into account other people? something probably not, not probably not and I'll tell you why it's union all major motion pictures are union and they're a really strict guideline and I remember when I was doing the payroll for the companies and I don't remember the numbers exactly but if your call time was before 5 a.m. you got a higher rate up until 6 a.m. and then you went back to your normal rate and if you work past 10 you got a higher bonus like 20 cents more an hour or something like that and also you get you hit gold time I mean you had after six hours from the time you start Six hours later, you have to take a break. And if they work you past that, they owe you a buck ten for like every six minutes or something like that, and it keeps accumulating up. So that's really not too much of a problem. That's going to be a problem in the indie movie world, but the indie movie worlds generally are going to be big budget enough that they wouldn't do that. It's more like the $10,000 movies. Those are the ones you got to watch out for that'll, that'll work you like a dog. Yeah, without question. Um, so just to give you an idea of how much the film incentive meant out here to the Phoenix area, this is just a quick graph and you can do the copy, let you guys pass that back. And basically what this is, is it takes you back to 2000. And this is a really good chart. Um, and basically how I get these numbers is I'm pretty much the only person in the state that does this, but I actually do a lot of surveys. And I talk to every production company that contacts me. I keep track of them. Every six months I talk to all the local companies to say, what did you do? Let me know what's out there so I can compile a lot of data. You see in 2000, that's when New Mexico and Louisiana came online. They became our big competitors. 
you start to see that the production in here, and this is just for Greater Phoenix, mind you, it's not the state of Arizona, it starts to decline. And all of a sudden, in the 2005-2006 year, and mind you, my fiscal year goes July to June. That's why there's you know six months of each year in my numbers. All of a sudden, you saw an immediate spike. That was because the movie The Kingdom came here, Hidden Palms. Um, and then there was a vampire locally produced movie that had a good budget called Nether Beast Incorporated that was shot out here as well. And then the following year is really when uh, The Kingdom kicked in, and they spent a lot of money out here in this area. We had some problems with the incentive, so that's why you see the 0708 year tip down. It had to do with the administration of the program and how people got into the queue. I won't bore you with that. It gets a little complicated, but we fixed it. We saw it jump up again, and then it and then word got out in Hollywood that we didn't have the incentive past 2010, so we saw a decline. And in fact, Everything Must Go was the last major movie filmed out here, and that wrapped in April of 2010. So I'll tell you, we've been a good three, four years now, basically, without a major movie filming out here for, for a long period of time. There were some, there were some people who were planning on I have my own opinions on the sound stages, personally, because <laughs> basically they're big warehouses is all that they really are. Um, yes, every year we've had people that come to us and say, we're going to build the sound stage, we're going to bring Hollywood out here to Phoenix, and I go, well, okay. You're like the fourth person this year that's told me this, and I've been doing this since 06. I yet to have seen anybody build anything out here. I even had somebody from the post office come and tell me that there was a need for it and they were going to build it. So you hear these people all the time that are going to do it, and what they're trying to do is they're coupling this massive soundstage complex, like $50, $70 million. With, if you've been to Universal Studios, you know, the Universal City Walk, that's what they want to do. They want to have the restaurants and the shops. They want it to be like Westgate, where you've got the Cardinals and the Coyotes, but they want the studios to be the anchor for that development. And the reality is, is without an incentive, you're never going to get a movie to go in there to actually rent the stage space because the price point's too high. Like at Warner Brothers, the sound stages that I was on, I think they were like 40000 a month rental was the going rate for them. And that didn't include all the electricity and all the other stuff. And believe me, those air conditioners are huge. But you know, a typical sound stage at Warner Brothers is about 30,000 square foot open span with like 50 to 80 foot ceilings. Mm -hmm. So it's a huge, big airplane hangar is really what it is. Totally soundproof with really high-end air conditioning so you don't hear it through the microphones. So everybody says they're gonna build this. I assume that once somebody, once we pass an incentive, probably somebody will go ahead and do it. But, you know, the studios only make so many movies per year, and there's a lot of these sound stages out there. So unless your incentive is just really, really kicking it, you're probably not going to have a lot of occupancy in those sound stages, and they may be dark for a while. So I would say that it's very speculative um, to build one of those. And that's actually why you don't see studios build studios anymore. Warner Brothers doesn't build them. Universal, Paramount, they don't build them. Why? They don't want the overhead. They don't want to manage and deal with them. They want to rent them. Even though they're paying a lot of money for it, they'd rather rent it and then walk away from it six months later and not have to maintain the security and all the other things that are going to go with it. So, yes, there has been a lot of talk of that happening, uh, but I've yet to see anybody actually do anything. Well, there's that old, uh, I always think of the old uh, studio they used to have out in Cave Creek. Yeah, it got leveled. It, yeah, they got leveled. Yeah. But, I mean, Dick that was Van out Dyke there. Studios. Yeah, Dick Van Dyke yeah. Studio was out there for years, and, mm -hmm. and, and they couldn't, I mean, it was basically abandoned. Yeah, because nobody was using it anymore. Yeah, yeah I mean, he, but I guess he built it to make the Dick Van Dyke show out yeah. here, and then he probably get used a couple times, but that was about it. Yeah, yeah so they leveled that for houses because the property's too valuable. Yeah. Then there was CJ Studios out in Avondale, and he passed away. The bank closed on it, and I think now it's apartments. So. Oh, did they? They leveled they the whole. Yeah, I believe it. I haven't been out there, but I remember at one point he had investors who were willing to pay like twenty million dollars, and he said, "No, I want thirty-six." It just would have taken it because a year later the market crashed yeah. and then it was worth absolutely nothing right. in that particular property. So, so that given was your opinions, I take it you don't coordinate with the ACA much. Oh uh, no, no, we work constantly with the ACA, uh, but not from the film side because they don't. There's no state film office. Right. That oh, doesn't right. exist anymore. That closed in July of 2011. Right on. And so it's and it's funny because I had entertainment partners, which puts out a paymaster to say what all the rates are, the overtime charges are, and they said, all right. So who's the central contact for Arizona? I said, well, there is none. Well, can we put you down? I said, no, because I keep getting phone calls about how do I film in Antelope Canyon? How do I film in Monument Valley? How do I film in the Grand Canyon? I don't know. It's not my area. I just know middle Arizona. So basically, the, the film offices, there's Flagstaff, Phoenix, and Tucson are the strong ones. 
So we've kind of split the state up amongst ourselves in three regions informally. We all talk all the time. We're all friends. And we just try and, you know, if it's southern Arizona, I kick them down to Shell Hunt. If it's in northern Arizona, I kick it up to Heather and Flagstaff to let them kind of be the point person for that particular area. Given your opinions and you working at the ACA, how come no one seems to chase the studio in the uh, people? You know, I don't know. I don't know that they really have taken anything very seriously. Um, since the ACA came about, um, the former person who was running the commerce, that was running the film office, Ken Chapa, moved over there. He's now the vice president of business attraction. And um, I don't know that they're necessarily chasing them. I think that people come to them with ideas, like they come to me, and they take a look at it, and they probably talk to Ken and realize the landscape and say, well, if you want to build it, we'll be supportive of you. But there's, there's a tremendous amount of risk right now to build something like that. Is there legislation actually pending? That's a good question, and I don't know the answer to that. Um, the Arizona Film and Media Coalition is the group that would be pushing that through. Uh, the, the city of Phoenix has basically said, we're not going to run this bill. We'll just support it if there's something that's out there. <clears throat> Based upon four years in a row of it not passing, the thought is, is if this is, I'm kind of paraphrasing from what the AFMC is saying, they're still deciding they really want to go after a state film office, which I think is tremendously important to have, and then add on the incentive the following legislative year. So it may not be until uh, the, the 2015 session, starting in January of 2015, that you'll see a bill introduced. Now, there may be some movement to push one right now, but basically, it's not. It's the chances of it happening are not very good. You probably have a better chance of getting a, a state film office because when you have an incentive, the question is, is who administers the program? Well, if you have no film office, then who's going to administer the program? Well, Department of Revenue. You know how experienced you know that can be. So it's important to have that that institution there in order to run the bill. So you kind of got to take baby steps and say well, maybe this isn't the right year, but there may be support enough when they engage all the politicians and all the elections settle down that maybe it is the right time. So it's kind of a wait and see, probably sometime late November, we'll have a better handle on that. Mm -hmm. So what else do I want to talk to you about? So anyways, um, in the meantime, since everybody's always been so focused on these incentives and they're really going after the pie in the sky, my kind of thought is, and I'll pass out my report that I just issued here. Sorry to hand you guys so much paperwork. I know everybody's online now, but sometimes it's easier for me to do it that way. So this is my... Um, the film office report that I just issued about uh, about a month or so ago. And basically it just talks about the film industry and the fact that we saw a 72% increase in spending here in Phoenix locally this past year. But my main concern with the report, though, was to really take a look and say, okay, if we're not going to have an incentive anymore, we're not going to get the Lone Rangers, then what do we need to be going after? Because right now our bread and butter is commercials and still photography. And that's what we see the most of. And the reason for that is that starting in October through about the end of April, you've got a lot of companies that are shooting their summer commercials or their summer patio furniture spots. Can't do it in Boston. Can't do it in Minnesota. Florida looks like Florida. You can do it in San Diego. you got a lot of marine layer blowing in. So people come here because it's 70 degrees and sunny out in the middle of January. So we see a tremendous influx of commercials happening out here and a lot of corporate industrial projects, things that happen inside of the convention centers, but they also take a lot of audio visual, which is part of our industry. I mean, the grips that are working on a commercial are the same grips they're going to be setting up inside of a convention center. So that's why we think of, we think of it all as basically the same industry. But what I'm trying to focus on is what's the next media? What's the new thing? Let's diversify. If we're not going to get this, what can we do in the meantime to help us out? So I'm, I'm personally trying to explore more of the new media side. And I met with some production companies locally here that don't even focus on commercials. They focus actually on the video content that goes onto a website. So for example, um, you know, a lot of doctors' websites are completely boring. So what if you were to take that doctor, put them on camera, give them a personality so that the customer can then see who it is they're going to be meeting with, then they may get more clients that way. <clears throat> so that's something to me that's very interesting. Also the technology side, I guess there's some guy in Chandler it's got a device you put your iPhone in, and then you can put your different lenses on the end of it. Have you guys oh, seen this? Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. That's the kind of technology. You know, could we be more of a tech hub for the creation of the of the products that's going to be used in the Spielberg movies and not get the Spielberg movies? So those are some things that I'm trying to toy with and to explore, and that's why I'm interested in gaming. 
because it clearly fits very well with what it is that the motion picture industry does. And in fact, I don't know if any of you have heard of a company called Arizona Virtual Studios out here. They're basically, as you get off the 143 towards McDowell and you, know, you go right or left, you go straight. Yeah, that's their place. And um, John Koop is the Dutchman, like on the tall Dutchman. He's, his father's into boats, like designing high-end, big mega yachts. So he got into the CAD design of them, and he's parlayed that into doing amazing computer graphics. And now he's hiring the kids out of UAT, I shouldn't say kids, but um, the students out of UAT, or like well, UAT, and he's and now they're making games over there too. So he's taking what he learned how to do CAD and then for television and now translating it into the gaming world using a lot of the ping pong balls and the live animation going on. So to me, I look at John's like facility coupled with the production side, and to me that's something that we could focus on. But I don't I haven't been able to figure out if we have the talent out here yet. But it could be very much the gaming industry side because what you're doing parlays very well into what they're doing. I was at a conference a couple of years ago, and they were talking about the movie uh, Spider-Man. It was the one that had Sandman in it. I can't remember which version that was. Spider-Man 3. Spider-Man 3, okay. And so they were talking about the guy that, that was designing all the sand and how they made that fall. And it turned out that there wasn't like some collective like you can have here. It was four guys in totally different parts of the country. The guy who was speaking was the head animator designer. He said he'd only met one of them in person before. He'd seen the other one on camera, but never shaken their hand. And they made that project, and then some of the people went off and they went into the medical world because they needed all the animation that goes on in there. So it just shows that this industry is now really evolving, not so much just into motion pictures, but also into gaming and into the medical world and into the educational sphere too. So, yeah, it's a, it's a very, very interesting time. So, do you guys have any questions or anything? So does that like cover animation and stuff then too? I mean, separate from, you know, I know there's a huge video component here in town, but is there any, uh, I mean, does animation just get lumped into video and film, or is it? Probably, I mean, we really don't yeah. have animation out here. The Fox Studios yeah, I remember was out the Fox here. Studio, yeah, yeah, and that was like right as Pixar took off, and that just died. Oh, yeah. really well, quick. that movie died, and it killed the studio. Yeah, it killed, and then they uh -huh. came in with the whole Cars thing, and it just yeah. took animation in a whole different world. No, I, you know, I don't know if we have that talent out here. I uh -huh. wish that we would. Um, but it's been hard because this incentive has taken a lot of our talent and shoved it to New Mexico and it shoved it to Louisiana and to Georgia. And so we don't have that knowledge base here that I think we used to have. We used to be pretty deep with our crews. Now it's tough to get enough people to do a major movie. And a lot of times I have to fly people in from California. I can imagine this is probably like the hot spot to film a desert movie kind of thing, but like if you can't do it with incentive here, you, the next stop is New Mexico. Yeah, 310 to Yuma. Where's Yuma? Arizona. Arizona. Yeah. Where was 310 to Yuma shot? Mexico. Albuquerque. There you go. So, yeah, no, you know, desert locations, you know, westerns aren't too popular. There's not a lot of them made. And so it, it so that's a little hard. I mean, if anybody wants to shoot a western, I tell them to go to Tucson because they've got old Tucson studios. But right here in the Phoenix area, we don't really have that anymore. That's why it's such a um, bummer that they didn't shoot Lone Ranger here because that's... Yeah. Western they were scouting all over southern Arizona and on the eastern border by uh, New Mexico. And with it, once once it was kind of determined that we weren't going to get that incentive, they went away. And that's and that's how these studios make their decisions. I mean, when when compiling these um, incentive legislations, we've been talking to Disney. We've been as Shelly knows Disney well. I know Warner Brothers. And Disney actually was really nice, and they took a sample pilot, crunched the numbers, and figured out if. if based upon the incentive numbers we had and where we would rank, and we basically ranked 12th for a pilot, for a TV show pilot, which is a test episode. But that's one of the determining factors. Nowadays, when a producer goes to make a movie, they come up with the script, and then they break the budget down, and they break it down, and we'll, well, they take a look at it, and the studios say, okay, where, where's the most advantageous states for us? They'll give the producer three or four options. They'll break down the script, figure out what the cost is, and then decide based upon where they can get the most money back and where they're going to go and make the project. So that's how Hollywood works nowadays, and it's also what factors in is how much is McDonald's going to pay you for the advertising rights to put on their, you know, their lunch pails and everything. All that gets factored in the distribution uh, here at, here at home, domestic as well as international. Those are all big factors that go into determining what movies are made, and that's why when you look at the movies nowadays, they're all just replicas of books and comic books and things that you've seen before, or even video games. 
you know, they're just replicating that now because it's got a built-in marketing advertising budget that they don't have to go out and do something new. So um, it makes it, you know, that's why in Hollywood is you see a lot of the same stuff coming out again. And now that I'm a parent, I have a four and a, yeah, four and a five-year-old. Now you're seeing Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, which I grew up with. You see a lot of these other products because there's no marketing involved. I'm a parent. I grew up with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, dressed as one for Halloween when I was a kid. My kid's dressed up now as a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. So there's that built-in factor. So, you know, a lot of the originality's kind of gone away a little bit with Hollywood. Um, but I think that industry is also transitioning a lot, too. Um, now you've got more online content. Like how many people here actually have DirecTV or Cox as their cable TV provider? Two, three, four. Okay, everybody else pretty much online. Okay. <laughs> I'm an online person, too. I actually I have Cox right now because I'm a football freak and can't get it online. Uh, so I've got to have my football. But come January, I cancel it. And I started back up again in August. But what's going on now is you've got Netflix, Hulu, um, Amazon Prime. You've got all these different, different channels. And they're all looking for content, constantly looking for content. And for the general consumer that may not be like you guys, you know, if you're into the indie games, you're out there seeking them and you're finding them. I don't have the time to do that when I get home. I just want to put on a show that I want to watch. So it could be now that, and so the problem that, the, that these channels are having is the studios are making these $150 million movies. You can only make like 10 of them a year. So what, what, so what, the, what the online distributors need is they need more content. So I personally think you're going to see smaller budgeted movies, 10, 20 million dollar range, to give more content to the Netflix and to the Hulu and to the Amazon because they can sell them more times. And that's what those providers want. So I think that you're also seeing a change in the size of movies and what's actually being made just on the distribution front. Have you looked, oh, sorry, I was going to say, have you looked studios that they have kind of going on, right? So this, yeah. these phenomenons where people are coming together more and more and it's becoming... Yeah, and I was just reading something uh, today. Do you guys ever read the Maverick blog, Mark Cuban's blog? Okay, if you're in tech, I highly recommend reading because he's, you know, he created, I, I don't know how to get rich, but it was on streaming online. Like, yeah, okay, exactly. So he was talking today about, about, about uh, YouTube and about how YouTube was trying to get the major content people on there. Well, apparently they found that if you ever go on there now, there'll be an ad for like two seconds, and they'll say, skip this ad. They're actually making money off that, and they're finding they're doing better with us uploading videos and them putting a commercial on for two seconds at the front and then trying to get a major product on and to stream it on YouTube. So what Mark Cuban said today, and definitely I think it's like his top article on his blog right now, read it, but he's basically saying that YouTube invests all this money to go after the big projects, and they're realizing now, well, it's not going to make us any money. People watching cat videos makes us more money. And so that's the direction that they're going right now. So yeah, go ahead in the back. I'm curious, so do you think that with the increased budgets, you're going to see more originality come out in terms of people saying, how can I do more with less? Mm, good question. I don't know. That's going to be dependent upon the consumers and what they're willing to watch. So yes, it does lend itself to the opportunity for more original content. But also, you it's like the web. There's so much out there then that it's hard to pick through and find a winner that you want to watch at nighttime. And also, I had heard this from a producer, I haven't confirmed it yet, but in the latest SAG after negotiations, the studio sided with them and, and, and worked with them, but they also told Netflix that if, you know, if you're looking for more content from us, you can only broadcast union movies. Okay. So all of your indie movies that you're thinking about making, and I'm going to you know, make for 20000 and put on Netflix, there's, I think that there may be some sort of legal arrangement where that's not allowed to be broadcast on Netflix anymore. Just like NBC won't broadcast really a non-union show, and when things like Wipeout or those reality shows came on and they got popular, there was all of a sudden a lot of grievances that were going on. So, yes, it may provide for it, but from the major distributors, they probably are going to stick to the union. So it creates the opportunity, but not necessarily the union. Correct. Exactly. And that's why you see other content providers that are coming up online that are specifically targeted for that indie market. So I'll be really curious, I mean, I'll be curious to see in a number of years how that actually pans out. Because me, like I say, a four or five year old, I get home, I don't have time to search. It's eight o'clock at night, I'm just beat. I just want to watch, like, you know, I, this pops my head because I saw that they were on the Today Show, but like, Will and Grace. I'm familiar with it, I just want to watch the show for a half hour and zone out and then go to bed. Or I want to watch sports. And sports is the only reason to me why cable and direct TV are still around, is because they've got such a lock on it. But, you know, you can get MLS soccer. You can get a lot of other things uh, through the Internet TV. Google's going to buy the Super Bowl one of these days anyway. So. I'm sure they will. <laughs> yeah, and apparently DirecTV is trying to buy Hulu because they don't have a presence in the online market. And Hulu is apparently for sale. 
and they're making a big play to grab that because they don't have that. You yeah, got to buy the whole set. What's it's that? Off the market. Oh, it is off the market. Yeah. Oh, what happened with it? Well, they decided not to sell it. But, uh, Google is always for sale until someone else. Right. Oh, okay. <laughs> Go ahead. So, when incentives were in Phoenix mm -hmm. for you, what was the or what were the main selling points? You know, for me personally, because the, the film office is part of economic development, so we're about attracting businesses out here and putting people to work. So to me, it was it was all the people that went to work, and it's also all the shopping in the local stores. Um, that's a really big one. I went to when I first started in this and running the film office. I went to Brooks Brothers to buy some shirts. I was talking to the sales guy and was you know starting chatting about what I do. And he said, "Wow, that movie The Kingdom came in here last night for 30 minutes, and they spent nine thousand dollars." And he said it was the easiest sale I've ever had. I didn't put a shirt on anybody. They came in with the sizes. They just picked it. And I went in the back. All I was doing was just pulling product, went to the register, and sold it. So that's the benefit of a major movie. The dry cleaners, they got to they clean all their clothing all the time. Um, the, the Home Depot type, the big box stores, they're huge beneficiaries. You know I mean, how, how did you sell them? On oh, how did I sell them? Yeah, versus New Mexico or Utah. Yeah, no, well, you... You can't say, well, I'll do this for you because it's really the incentive, and the incentive is what it is. So what you try and do is sell them on how easy it is to film out here. Um, when you go to Los Angeles, I've been told that the permit's like $675, lasts three days, cops are $88 an hour. Here in Phoenix, the permit's 100 bucks, lasts you for the duration of your shoot, could be three weeks, three months, um, and then cops are 40 bucks an hour. You know, so those, are, so those are a lot of the things, and it's also the shooting environment. When you go to a place that's filmed in a lot, like I'm sure Albuquerque's getting this way, people get sick of it. Neighbors don't want it, you start getting complaints. Out here, when we had the TV show Hidden Palms, out in Ahwatukee, neighbors were so excited they'd have barbecues on the front yard to watch. And so those are the type of things that to a producer says, okay, I'm gonna be able to do what I want out here and get what I need accomplished. Versus in Los Angeles or some other cities are gonna be much more restrictive. So I've always said since the beginning, I don't wanna be LA. I don't want all these permits. I don't want anything. I just want them to be able to come out here and to make it happen. And so that's that's a really big selling point. But Phoenix is a selling point, just on its own, just the way we look. I mean, Arcadia is probably the most filmed in residential neighborhood out here. And you've all driven through there. Doesn't look anything like Phoenix. We actually had the Indiana Farm Bureau come out there and film their summer <laughs> spots from here because it looked like Indiana in the summertime with big green lawns. You know, some houses have the cactus, but you can find patches with a couple homes in a row. So Phoenix is its own big selling point. We had uh, Nissan uh, came out here, and this was Nissan for the French and the UK market. Ad agency was in Paris, contracted through a production company in Montreal, and they ended up landing here in Phoenix because they needed an urban city, an urban European city. And so they picked downtown Phoenix uh, for the location. So Phoenix really sells itself. And the local producers that are out here that are out bidding on these projects, I try and work with them because I want them to get the jobs as well. Um, and so they're out advocating for Phoenix as well. So it's a big, Phoenix in itself is a selling point. The permitting process and the lack of a bureaucracy and red tape, because my signature represents everybody in Phoenix, allows them just to come in here and do what they need to do and not have to deal with the law. You know, and also I'm very protective of them. I don't publicize when they're out here. Uh, we had a SIA, was it SIS? I can't remember what TV show it was. I think it was SIS. And they were out here filming, and word got out to the media that they were here. So all of a sudden, the studio, Sony, had to hire a publicist to come out to deal with the onslaught of the publicity. Channel 3 didn't get, wasn't, wasn't on the ball, didn't realize the press release, saw it on the other networks. So because the period had ended where we were allowing the press in there, and by we, I mean Sony, they flew and hovered their helicopter right over the set, blew the gels everywhere. They had to shut down production. So the fact that I don't publicize what they're doing, I don't put out news alerts, I don't put it on my website until I feel comfortable that they're not going to be bothered with their project. They also like knowing that they can kind of come in here incognito and do their thing, which you upsets a lot of people because they want to know what's going on here. You mentioned that Arizona takes a while to film. Out of curiosity, was New Mexico first in terms of the value of the I incentive? don't know what it was. They just told us what we were, but I think New Mexico and Louisiana and Georgia would be pretty high up there. Michigan had an incentive where they were paying back it was between 40 and 43 percent um, on dollars spent. I say, I know, like in your mind, I can tell you like that. You like those numbers, yeah. It, you know, and so that's one of the issues with these incentives is that sometimes you're giving away more than you're making. But in New Mexico's case, you can make the argument of, yeah, and now we built this industry, and look at what it's done for tourism. People now know New Mexico. 
So that's the advantageous point, but that's a story that's hard to get across when the Department of Commerce is putting out reports saying that the, that the incentive program lost $8 million. So th those are the challenges. So, you know, I remember another good example, just to, just to kind of keep going on your question there. There was a movie that was, I believe, with Reese Witherspoon. It got made. I don't remember the name of it. But she was on the U.S. women's softball team, blew out her knee, ended up with some baseball playboy who played for a baseball team, and it took place in Boston. And it was all about her dealing with her, you know, what's, what's, her, what's her life going to be? She's 30 years old. What's she going to do? Her whole life has been softball. So they had scouted New York. They had scouted Washington, D.C. They had scouted Boston. And I think the accountant said, you need to go out to Phoenix. So they came out here right after Christmas. And one producer did all these Tom Cruise movies. He looked like, um, oh, who's the Andy Warhol with long hair, and he was British. And this other guy was the first AD that was now becoming a producer. And they, I remember them just standing there in the middle of downtown Phoenix going, I had no idea you guys had this. This is absolutely amazing. And so we took them around. We found a place that would work for a soundstage for them. It's an old warehouse that held Revlon lipstick that was air-conditioned and soundproof, 100,000 square feet. But the movie was written in Boston. And since I went to college in Boston, I knew what the brownstones looked like. And I told them, listen, if you're going to make this movie, we can't, you, can't, you can't make it based in Boston because it's just not going to work here. We can cheat a scene, but you can't do the whole movie and call it Boston and Phoenix. We're just too different. So they actually, they actually looked, and it came down to, um, they came down to, Was to, to Washington, D.C. and Phoenix. They knocked out Boston and uh, New York City. I couldn't believe I beat New York. Only time in my life's ever happened. <laughs> and so it really came down to the numbers, and then they decided to go with Philadelphia at the end of the day because they were really stuck on they wanted it to be set in Boston because of the Boston Red Sox were really big at the time. And so we lost out on it because of that. And there was also the fact that we didn't incentivize the above-the-line people, the Reese Witherspoons, the directors. They were part of our program, and so they said, we're going to make we're going to get more money back by sticking on the East Coast with this product. So that's one of the reasons why we lost that one. Do you have any other examples of game companies like you mentioned, Two XL and mm -hmm. Cheyenne, before getting some of the incentives? Is there a list, or is there some kind of no? There, more? no, there isn't a list, and it really wasn't too much on anybody's radar. The game industry back in two thousand, you know, six to two thousand and eight. It wasn't until about twenty ten that I think that we all became aware of it when the state film office went out and visited Cheyenne and it went, "Whoa, we had no idea this was even out here." So, you know, the gaming, it's been very underground. And you know, obviously, I think you can probably agree that it's a perception of the industry and, you know, who's involved in it. But the reality is, is that it's a big money industry. I mean, you're hiring, you know, freshmen or seniors out of college for $75,000 a year. Those are the high-tech wage jobs that Phoenix is now looking for. So I'm even trying to convince, and Ben, you can help me do this, do convince the city <laughs> leaders to actually really focus on this industry and don't look at it as a bunch of people smoking pot, eating Cheetos, and playing video games. <laughs> Look at it as an actual industry that pays a lot of money and is a very high-tech industry. And I think like Austin has really done a great job with that. Phoenix, I mean, to me, we're right. We've got a lot of data centers, you know, and the hurricanes, you know, all the natural rel you know, natural disasters that go on out here. I was right by, by AZ Virtual Studios, by the way. Oh, you do? Dude, but I.O. is like the biggest data center in America. And I, I know. Just like, yeah, yeah. Like, and that's just what's ridiculous. And do you know what that originally was? A water company. It was a water distribution company. company. They built it, and then they never moved in. <laughs> no, the guy, oh, I won't get into uh, that. <laughs> <laughs> but it was like Niagara or Callahan yeah. water or something like that. You want to know about that? Uh, I'll tell you later. <laughs> so, you know, there's a lot of that tech that's out here. We just need to not focus on the data center so much. Mm -hmm. But I think focus on the creative side, and to me, that's film and gaming. Yeah. So you guys have anything else for me? Uh, no. You're about to ask me something. Uh, I was just shaking my head. No, I don't have anything. Okay. So you've you mentioned this before. Mm -hmm. How much competition do you get from Europe and Canada, Toronto, Vancouver? I noticed there's a lot of U.S. stuff there. Montreal. Yeah, Montreal. Oh, and Prague. Mm -hmm. um, that's another big one. You know, that's only for the realm of the big budget movies. They're the ones really looking for that. If it's something, a project that's not eligible for an incentive, or it's not going to make financial sense to go after an incentive because you got to pay for accountants and everything to triple check all the work before the state will give you whatever the incentive is, um, you know, we really don't compete with them that much. In fact, I think my biggest competition of all places is South Africa when you go international. I see. Yeah. Why? I've lost projects in South Africa, and I've won projects from South Africa. Because in wintertime, they've got the same climate we do. And they've got a good film industry down there as well. So yeah, but they're like they're always way different. 
Yeah, but, but you can cheat things, though. You can cheat them and just call them something else. Like, great example, there's hundreds of examples, but you remember the movie Thelma and Louise yeah. at all? In the final scene, they drive off the Grand Canyon. That wasn't the Grand Canyon. Because the Grand Canyon wouldn't let them film off, film there because they thought too many people would want to drive off a cliff in Grand Canyon. So they shot it either in Mexican Hat, which is by Kayanta kind of area, or up at Bryce Canyon. I've heard conflicting reports, but I know it wasn't at the Grand Canyon. But when you see the movie, where do you think they are? Grand Canyon. So it doesn't really matter. So a lot of movies are shot in places that have nothing to do. Like um, um, Iron Mountain. What was the Civil War movie that came out with Jude Law a couple Cold years ago? Cold Mountain. Cold Mountain. Okay. So this is a great example of why locations don't matter. So, so I think it was in North Carolina is where it takes place, that movie, right? You'd know. Okay. Way to go, Demon Deacon. It's your new name, by the way. <laughs> uh, so that movie was out there. The state film office was flying them around the helicopter, showing them the actual locations. They were all signed up for it. Well, then the rights of the movie got sold to, I want to say it was Miramax and the Weinstein Brothers. I could be wrong. So where do they end up shooting the movie? Prague. Okay. So... <laughs> But you all thought it was over down in the southeast, but in fact, that was shot in Europe, the whole movie. So it just kind of blows your mind. It's, it's all about the incentives, and it's about the bottom dollar and where they're going to get the most for their money. And, you know, if you're dealing with $100 million and you're going to get back $10 million in some sort of an incentive, well, it gets you the bigger actor, the bigger explosion. Maybe you can shoot for two or three more days to really perfect the product. Um, so that's why they really go after those things. Any other questions for you guys? So, so do you yeah. work more with the commercial side yeah. since we're not getting the big business, or do you work more with the independent movies? Uh, the independent movies, to a degree, they tend not to want to contact me because they don't want to have extra costs oh, sure. associated. Oh, okay. So a lot of them go a little underground, so which little is, you know, yeah, yeah, I mean, this is the sixth largest city, and I'm one person. I mean, the reality is, is I'm not going to be able to, but it's more when you get in the downtown area or you're putzing on the street or you're in a park. Or so, something that the city of Phoenix owns, and then you need to go through me. I do a lot with these reality shows, what I call reality TV specials. Because me, a reality show is The Bachelor, which is like film at a location. Oh, sure. But, but, but what we tend to get is like the like biggest loser, say the contestants out here in the Phoenix area, they'll want to go show them hiking South Mountain. So they come out for a day or two, and I work with them to accomplish what it is they're looking for. So I deal with a lot of those projects, and the reason why I work with them is because they sell the content to a distributor. Distributor wants to know that all the permits and everything are in order, so I get hammered with projects I really don't wish to have anything to do with. But you know, I got to issue these permits for them. So commercials are definitely the biggest money maker right now. The reality type shows is probably quantity wise the biggest, but has the lowest investment or impact here locally. And they really didn't even hire anybody; they just fly out their crew, maybe hire a PA to drive the 15 pass van around. Somebody that knows how to where to get the deals at the local camera shops. Do you also deal then with the sporting? No, we don't no. do sporting at all. Oh, yeah, okay. my, my, my permit doesn't cover um, concerts or sporting events. Oh, okay. Or like if there's a marathon. Like somebody called me today because they want to film portions of the zombie walk going on here in a oh, couple uh -huh. weeks. That's more of a public event, so I don't get involved oh. with that. Mine's more scripted and planned out well in advance. What are the additional costs that an indie film will actually incur by doing these reality shows? You know, it's only $100. Um, so the permit fee is pretty cheap to me. Um, it depends upon what they're doing is how I have to react and so the police officers that comes into play depending upon what it is you're doing um, you know like if it's a simple love scene two people holding hands you may not even need a cop you may need one cop depending upon where you are if you're trying to run a red light it's going to be five cops that are out there because I got to have one in each street about a block up blocking it and then one at camera radioing when to shut it down so really, those are the only costs. The kicker that comes in is they need to provide insurance. And insurance can run you several hundred dollars. It could be anywhere from $5,000, or excuse me, $500. If you're a proper production company, I think it's around $15,000 a year. So that's your cost. But also, you're going to need that insurance to get into most businesses and to rent some sort of equipment. But it's something they try and just you know use their own cameras and try and get away with it that way. So what is the yeah. Pope feeling with the legislature? It's just bad originally. It's not good this upcoming year right now. We'll see how the elections uh, pan out here in November about who gets elected, who doesn't. But the general sentiment is, is it's probably going to be January 2015 before a bill can properly be introduced. The Arizona Film Media Coalition may introduce one now. They're still deciding. Uh, but their target's going to be the, the state film office because we don't have one right now. So that's more where their focus is. 
but they may introduce something, but we'll see what happens. And Goldwater Institute is after it and two others. Goldwater Institute for Enterprise Arizona, the Tax Club of Arizona. There's there's a lot of these groups, and, and they'll actually go down. And I don't know if you all know how a bill works its way through its kind of political science classes, but basically there's thousands of bills that get introduced, and if they get introduced either through the Senate or through the House, either way, the, the, the head of the House or Senate, they assign them to different committees. The committees then will look at 40 bills. They'll recommend what goes on to the floor for a vote. So it's within those committees is where we're always getting stuck. And it's because you, got, you do have opposition, and they do come up, and they do talk, and they do say why it's a bad deal. And so that has a big influence on these people. And obviously, you know, people can donate to certain candidates. Goldwater Institute does a lot of donating. Film industry, we don't typically have a lot of money because we're all independent, and we don't have those kind of funds to put together and donate. So that's been a real challenge, too, is raising funds to get seen and get noticed uh, by these uh, public representatives. Do you have one on the way back? I was going to say, uh, I, maybe I missed this, I saw the date, but what, what, what would you say is the key between of actually growing from 2011 to 2012? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a $5 million annual jump. That's not insignificant. What, what was the, who contributed to that growth? Yeah, it's definitely, to me, um, it's the commercials. Those are the big things we've seen. We've seen quantity-wise, I think, on my last page. Uh, I don't have the comparison on here. What, what changed to cause that kind of wild, sudden, more commercial trend? What, what, what changed? I have no idea. And the film industry is also trying to figure that out um, as to why. And I was talking to a guy who owns M, uh, MP&E uh, Camera Equipment Rentals, a guy named James Phillips. And uh, he's a friend of mine, too. And he said, you know, I was busier in August than I've ever been. He said, I don't know what's going on. And I don't know what's going on either. But it's, sometimes it just goes in ways. But I think that there's been a lot more corporate industrial work done out here, a lot more commercials. And I think the ease of filming out here is starting to percolate. And people are knowing that, oh, we can get this stuff done in Phoenix. And so that's why they're starting to come out here. Um, a lot of it also, too, has to do with the economy. Um, it, you know, it was when we hit this huge recession, one of the things companies pulled back on was that advertising dollars. If you remember, if you've been out, lived out here for a couple of years, you had to live with those Steve Nash APS ads where he's throwing the ball at people's heads for like two or three years. Normally they made new new ads every year. Well, they, they stopped. And so they started to, to, to ramp that up again. And so that's why you start to see more. I think because companies were more confident about the economy and more willing to spend the dollars and willing to spend more dollars on those products because now they were starting to see more income come in from what they were selling. Mm -hmm. So um, North Carolina and Michigan are both states where they're thinking about getting rid of their incentives that can only help us? Potentially, yeah. I mean, you know, it just goes back to the math. I mean, a lot of states may be finally taking a look and saying, this thing isn't penciling out, and we've been doing this for five or six years, and we're not really seeing the return on investment. So you may start to see a lot of states getting rid of these programs or scaling them back significantly. Um, but, but, you know, it's, it's the challenge. You know, there's all these studies that are out there that will say, you know, the yes, incentives are really good. They actually make money for a state. You'll find incentives that say, no, this actually loses a lot of money for the state. And I kind of equate it to uh, welfare. I think we all think we should help our fellow American. The question is, is how much and at what cost? Mm -hmm. Republicans will give you one number. Democrats will give you another number. Not that either one of them is right or wrong, but you're getting two different opinions. So you can read all these studies all day long, and you'll read for one state that will say how great it is, and another one report will say how bad it is for that state. So it's just kind of what do you think? You know, how much do you want to send about legislature? What's that? It's the capriciousness of the legislature. Pretty much. It's up to them and, you know, who it is that voted them in, you know, and what it is, whether it's, you know, and these incentives, regardless if it's a red state or a blue state, they're still getting the same type of reports that are out there. Mm -hmm. So, and it's, it's interesting. So it'll be very interesting to see in a couple of years. You know, incentives, in theory, you give an incentive in order to attract a business, and then you take it away. Mm -hmm. And then that business lives on its own. No different than if you have a clothing store. Mm -hmm. Maybe you know you want to get some new foot traffic through there, you do a sale. Or maybe you've got too much inventory of t-shirts, you do a sale. And you reduce your stockpile, and now you're back down to a level area. But the fact is, is that once that sale's gone, you're still there operating. With the film industry, you're offering an incentive to an industry that doesn't, that's not building infrastructure. In sound stages, they're just coming in and renting. They're not building them. So you're offering an incentive to come in here and make the product. Mm -hmm. But then once they leave, they're not leaving anything here other than their money. So how, how sustainable is that? You know, is it incentive or is it, or is it a, um, what am I trying to, 
you uh, because of an S for your name. It's not it's like a, subsidy. a subsidy. Yeah, like it's subsidy. And some people can argue that it's a subsidy, not an incentive, because they're leaving New Mexico. That could be seen as an incentive. I mean, if the incentive went away and you had other states that lost their incentives, they now have infrastructure. So now it is a place that Los Angeles can go to and where people can film. Well, I mean, isn't that what you're really trying to do is you're trying to build a crew base and you're trying to build a, a production base here that brings in more work. You know, Correct. It, 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 but as long as your neighbor's got a sale going on, you're yeah. going to go to your neighbor yeah. or you're sure. going to go to the store next yeah. door it's that's basically like selling the same product. Season. What's that? And there is a sale season afoot. So. You're correct. Exactly. So, you know, and that's why you see some states, they would be at 25%. And don't quote me on these states, but let's, let's say, like, Louisiana was at 25%, and then Alabama went up to 30%. Well, now Louisiana's going to try and get to 35%. So you're always trying to one-up your neighbor in order to get them here. Our argument has always been, okay, let's not be at the level of New Mexico, which I think is 25%. Let's be at 20%. Because we're so close to L.A. that you can drive your vehicles here. The actors can fly in and out and go to their kids' t-ball games. And so that alone makes up for the 5% difference. And so that's why we felt we didn't need to be competing with the high numbers that other states were doing. We felt we could operate at a little bit of a lower number and still attract the same amount of projects here. Did you get any resistance or fallout from what happened with Rhode Island and 38 Studios, uh, Kurt Schilling's company? No, because we were we, we were we were done by then. Um, but that was a concern, you know. And there's a misperception about these incentives too. A lot of people think when they hear an incentive that the state's just paying them cash up front. The fact is, is that no incentive is paid out until after you make your product and you turn in all your financial statements. Then they issue you the incentive. So. I don't know too much about that particular one, but it seemed to me like he was getting investors based upon the assumption that he was going to be getting this. Then when he didn't yeah. get it, yeah, and yeah. then when he didn't get it, everything went kaput. And we had a couple projects here in Arizona from some local film producers that they, you did, in order to get to the $250,000, you can aggregate a bunch of projects and consider them one. But the thing is, you have to make all of them. So let's say they had five that they submitted. They got over that $250,000, but they only made four of them. Well, we, the law said you have to do all the things you submit, and because you didn't do that one, you don't get anything. And it hurt them really badly. So that may be kind of a similar example of what happened in Rhode Island. Well, 38 Studios also got shut down by the Rhode Island government because when they found out that they were trying to get a loan, to basically, it was basically they had all the money they would have had as long as Rhode Island was like, going to push them past another day because investors were going to give them money. But then once Rhode Island was like, yo, I'm not going to give you money, all their investors that were looking into it basically got a false sense of security and they just took mm -hmm. off. Yeah. So they could have they could have published like what was it uh, Amalar MML but they they lost all the money because Rhode Island closed on them. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So and that's you know another thing too is a lot of these states when they, when you have a iffy political climate, yeah. studios will stay away because they don't want to send in a big project and then have all of a sudden the incentive disappear and now they're mm -hmm. stranded. So that's why after April of 2010, we haven't seen a major movie because they knew it was a little murky as to whether or not we were going to get an incentive. Um, and so they just stayed away from us. We just weren't on the table for consideration, and now we're permanently off the table for consideration. You talk about um, building up the game industry then here. Mm -hmm. What could we do to help you or not do? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think just be seen more. Um, I think don't, you know, I think, you know, this the perception thing. Dress nice, um, you know, look professional, and go and meet with your city leaders, talk to your representatives, make a really good showing of yourself. Um, to me, that's the biggest thing. And just to show, if there's any type of economic numbers you have to show what it is and then what it could be like within Austin, like a report like that, and to paint the picture that we are prime to be the next Austin, I think that would turn a lot of their heads. I mean, the people down in the state capitol, they're really concerned about what are the wages because they're really going after these high-tech jobs they're not so much interested in the 10 buck an hour call center job even though it creates a lot of jobs so numerically it looks good they're really focusing now more on the high wage jobs um, those are like data center type jobs which they actually do pay a lot of money for those if you can paint that picture because that picture's been painted really well that would help out um, getting an economic impact study is definitely key gpec um, is a place where I don't know if there's a model for the gaming industry to show, but I know that, remember the gentleman who we met with from London? Right. Well, from right. L.A., but represented London. Probably, yeah, yeah that, that study, I was, I've been kind of loosely reading that, 
And they're showing about how it's a billion dollar industry, how much it makes, how it went away, why it needs to come back. That's the kind of thing that needs to be done. Okay. That yeah, type I'm of speaking to Mara in Big Tech. Oh, I'm you saying, are? I'm meeting with her next week. Who are you meeting with? Mara. Okay. Um, See, see what you can do. But they, I want to do something very similar to what the ed tech community has been doing. Mm -hmm. So they've been starting something, I think, Parchin and ASU and GTEC got together now to start doing regular cocktails. But I want to do more than this, of course. But it, yeah. but that already starts bringing the community together. Um, and, then, and then from there, you know, move on to see what yeah. the needs and how we can start gathering some of the information from everybody around them. So oh, yeah. And you know, and you're kind of in the same boat I am in a way because you've got a lot of people in the closet that are doing this and maybe making money, right. but you don't know where they are. Same thing with filmmakers. A lot of them are out there making a living doing this. I mean, they own homes and cars, but you just don't know who they are or where they are. And so it's hard trying to figure that out and to entice them to give you their data so that you can paint a picture. But does anybody know what GPEC is? You all familiar with that group? It stands for Greater Phoenix Economic Council. And basically, the economic departments from all the cities in Greater Phoenix, they pay into GPEC. And GPEC goes out and travels internationally and does trade shows, and they try and bring the business into the greater Phoenix area. We as cities really don't have the ability to go flying all over the world and to try and attract us. And plus, it's kind of hard when you've got Mesa at a booth and Prague and Phoenix in the booth next door in Prague, and we're trying to look like we're fighting over the same business we're trying to attract. So we pay GPEC to go out there and do that for us. And then they let the members, the city members, know who is interested, and they send out you know, these code names with these projects with some data, and then we all work on trying to attract those projects here to the Phoenix area. So that's GPEC. So to sell them and Barry Broom and those guys on the idea of the, of the gaming industry, and that it can be viable, because they're looking after, they're looking for these type of tech things, that's going to be a huge, uh, huge win for you. Right. It will help us all out, actually. Yeah, we just had a, actually I was just told a couple of days ago, so we will now be having a, a studio move into the space here incubate and bring eight people in here based on a contract that they're putting together with people out in Vienna. Okay. So this is, again, he came to me saying, who are the who are the associations I need to go to to talk about bringing companies into the Phoenix area? Yeah. Of course, I pushed him right to GPEC and ACA. Yeah. But I think, yeah, any more of that that I can find out. I mean, yeah. so if anybody if anybody around you know knows about any of these kinds of deals or anything, yeah. let us know so we can make, yeah. them, make them aware. Definitely. In, in GPEC and the Arizona Commerce Authority, they're really looking for what they call foreign direct investment, which is companies out of Vienna that are pumping money here into the Phoenix area because that makes our wealth grow when that happens. Also, when we export out to Mexico, whatever our products are, we get their money to come in. That builds up our economy versus you going to the grocery store. That pays the salary of the grocery store person who then goes to the dry cleaners, who then pays to have a house built by the condo. That's just money that's just circulating around in a wash bin. But getting that type of money coming in, that speaks volumes and will really perk your ears up. Cool. Well, nothing else. I'll be around for a few minutes, but thank you all. Yeah, thank, well, you, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. So, again, thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, Game Collab, again, we're a membership organization, so please check it out. Become a member. We've got some great incentives to be able to work out of the space, Game of Mind general help out the community as we were just talking about so we can grow this this industry here in Phoenix. But uh, join us next time. The next osmosis is actually I think on the 7th of November with uh, Ken George. So he's one to kind of bring the studio in here so you might have some really interesting insights after his trip to Vienna and stuff. Um, and after that, uh, hey, I'm still lining the next one up. But anyway, um, stay tuned. Thank you everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Thanks.